Well, good day, everyone. This is David McNichol, and uh, thank you for your interest in this subject of personal pension plans. We've got uh, quite an interesting uh, set of slides and story to tell you, and we're very pleased to have J JP Laporte of Integris here with us today, and he'll be uh, conducting most of the uh, presentation. Uh, Joe Poshadiniak and myself will just lead us off with uh, a few thoughts about how we manage uh, personal pension plans, and uh, then JP will take over and show how um, the differences between RSPs, IPPs, and personal pension plans. Um, just as a, as a point before we get going, um, many times this comes up from a business owner to their uh, accountant and or their other uh, professional advisors, and many times it gets put, put pushed aside because it's un misunderstood. And so we're gonna do our best to try to make it uh, better understood today. But for those uh, planners and insurance agents on the line, uh, don't dismiss this outright because this is an excellent door opener that might lead to a planning opportunity or uh, even something in the, uh, the life insurance uh, side of things. So. Yeah, that's just one thing always leads to another. Um, open up the deck here and we'll get going. So we do have a disclaimer, so please uh, pay attention to that, that we are not giving investment advice today. Uh, you should uh, seek out to your, your own advisors and or come directly to us, and then we can advise you uh, individually. <clears throat> So just a brief overview of who McNichol and Associates are for those who are new to this uh, call. Uh, it's a business that was started in 2001. Uh, we specialize in, in helping individuals and their planning. And uh, those are all the type of accounts we, we help with. Uh, and as you can see, wedged in the middle are individual pension plans and personal pension plans, which we uh, favor the latter. Joe, I'm going to pass it over to you just to let everybody know how uh, we structure the portfolios and how alternatives uh, fit in. So take it away. Sure. Um, thanks very much, David, and good afternoon. Um, yeah, definitely. Just just like everything we we do at McNichol, it's uh, it, it's done with a lot of care and and attention to detail, and that goes for our uh, alternative holdings. Um, you know, right away, what's what's the immediate benefit that an investor can obtained by uh, incorporating alternatives into their portfolio? Uh, well, the answer is really better diversification and more optimal risk-adjusted returns. And that's uh, exactly what's uh, shown on the uh, graph here uh, towards the uh, lower right-hand side of the uh, picture. And so we have um, at our firm uh, a very well-developed uh, time-tested alternative program that um, we're certainly uh, very pleased to, to offer uh, both existing and uh, prospective new investors. Uh, so we'll just move to the next slide. And um, this is a uh, more more of an academic study, um, which you know I, I wanted to uh, just incorporate into the presentation, not to sort of distract uh, from the topic, uh, the important topic today of of the personal pension plans, but really to just sort of um, draw on the academic world to to show and to highlight the importance of incorporating alternative assets into uh, an overall asset mix and so you can see here two lines the um i guess light blue or turquoise line on the bottom is a traditional or conventional investment portfolio only whereas the uh, the gold line uh, or bar up top incorporates both alternatives and traditional uh, assets into the mix and this is this is a a, a way that um you know, here at McNichol, we've been investing uh, for for a long, long time. And you know, if you're you're not investing in this sort of uh, manner now, you should certainly come in and, and as David mentioned, uh, individually talk to to us about how that can be achieved. But the main objective is to uh, increase portfolio efficiency, and and in you know, in the land of uh, portfolio management, efficiency is translation for uh, getting more optimal returns per uh, per unit of risk uh, that you've taken. That's great, Joe. Thanks a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last webinar we did was on the risk versus reward. And um, 
uh, if you did not get uh, the invitation or the uh, the actual recording of that just reach out to our office our website will be at the end of the deck here and uh, we'd be happy to uh, supply that with you um, before i pass it off to jp laporte i'd just like to show everybody in the chat function here we typed something in there already showing that we'll be using a interactive calculator halfway through jp's presentation and the uh, url link is there so you can play around with that uh, at your leisure and um, we also encourage you to type in any questions you have in the uh, chat function we've received several in advance uh, from the invitations uh, so stay tuned for the end of the discussion for uh, uh, a Q&A session uh, JP Laporte, I'm going to pass it over to you to maybe just give a brief introduction on yourself and then uh, take it away with the slide deck. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. So um, the uh, purpose today is really to go through a case study for a medical doctor because we find that it's the easiest way of unpacking all of the information and all of the variables that comes with a personal pension plan. It's much easier to go through a story than me lecturing about tax law and pension law. So my background, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pension lawyer uh, by training, but I'm also uh, the CEO of Integris Pension Management as per the invitation for today. And in that capacity, my role is to oversee the the development of um this business this personal pension plan business across canada so if we could um, move to the next slide um and get right into sort of the uh the core of why we're here today we found out after eight years almost nine years now of doing this that business owners typically have three questions that they ask themselves when they're presented with a PPP um, case study or, or proposal. And one of them is, you know, is there is is this going to allow me to pay less tax than most Canadians who are not using a PPP? Because um, at the end of the day, paying less tax is seen as positive, and of course we agree. So that's one of the key questions that people ask. How much more can I save on my taxes if I join a PVP. The second key question is, will it make me richer at the end of the time frame um, without me having to take on any additional market risk to achieve that? If I, if I have a certain level of risk tolerance and I ask McNichol and Associates to invest in one of their funds, what, how much more can I expect to retire on if I upgrade from an RSP to a PPP. So that's the second key question that always comes up. And then finally, people say, well, I'd love to do this, but you know, I don't want to spend money on fees uh, in the hope that I will end up with more money in retirement. I want value for money. So can this be done uh, in a way that this auto finances itself, that I don't have to shell money out of my own pocket in order to achieve these goals of tax minimization and value maximization. So that's really what sits in the, in the, in the back of most business owners that we talk to. They don't often say it, but that's really what they're thinking. So let's next slide, please. So that then, of course, when a, a, an accountant or a financial planner or an advisor um, introduces the concept of the PPP. Most people say, what's a PPP? Never heard of it. So of course, it's relatively new. I mean, we've been around for almost nine years now, but um, still in Canada, there are quite a few folks out there that have never heard of a PPP. So you guys are sort of part of the vanguard. Um, anyway, so what it is, it's a combination of registered pension plan. So it's governed by section 147.1 of the Income Tax Act. And that's the section that governs very large pension plans like the Teachers Pension Plan of Ontario, the OMERS Pension Plan, the GM Pension Plan. It also uh, is used for individual pension plans or IPPs. So that's the 
the legislative anchor around which we built the PPP. What's special about the PPP is that being a combination plan, it offers three components under one roof. So we have, and you can see here in this uh, table or this graph, I should say, that we have a defined benefit component, which is everything an IPP has, we have. So there's nothing an IPP has that we don't have. Then it has a defined contribution component, which is an account, and it has an additional voluntary contributions account. And what's really fun and exciting about PPPs is that by having thrown everything under one simple kind of uh, combined plan, we can play off the income tax rules and the pension rules to maximize how much money business owners can set aside for retirement in a tax sheltered environment. So there are rules that govern each account and we've kind of given a little bit of detail here. We're not going to go too, too much in detail right now on this slide, but suffice it to say that if you're using the defined benefit component in a given year, uh, we, can do, we can do current service contributions, past service contributions, uh, meaning we can recognize years there where you were paying yourself a salary. Um, and we can also do what I call qualifying transfer. We can roll in some RRSPs in there to help purchase that past service. All of this is done on tax deferred basis. And in some provinces, these contributions are locked in, but more and more provinces are unlocking these types of contributions. So Ontario just recently uh, decided to give our clients the ability to make contributions and not have the money locked in. So if they needed it for emergency purposes, they would be able to pull that out of the account. So that's the defined benefit component. We have the defined contribution component where the company is only required to do a 1% of salary or T for income. That's all that goes in there. And then the complement account to the DC account is the additional voluntary contribution account. And here, the client that's an employee of their own corporation, uh, can make contributions on a voluntary basis, ranging from anywhere from 0% of salary all the way to 17% of salary. And that gives you a personal tax deduction. So just uh, on your T4 slip for the accountants in the room, uh, that's box 20 of your T4 slip shows uh, employee contributions to a registered pension plan, tax deductible right away on first dollar. Now, the other thing that the ABC account is really uh, good for is to transfer existing RRSPs that you might, ha you might have elsewhere um, into the plan with no tax because the transfer is done on a tax-exempt basis. And what that does is that it consolidates under one roof all of your registered dollars and it gives the corporation that's sponsoring the PPP the ability to claim a corporate tax deduction for all of the investment management fees that are normally associated with running this kind of money. So if, if you're using McNichol and Associates and they're charging a fee, that fee now becomes tax deductible to your business. Um, so, and it's also becomes creditor protected because it's now under uh, the rules of the pension plan. And that money is never locked in because the contributions were voluntary in the first place. So let's move on to the next slide. So the reason why we're so excited about this webinar is because when you do the math, when you crunch the numbers and you project forward, given some arbitrary rate of return on assets, here we picked 5%, what happens is that because the different accounts under the Income Tax Act uh, have different limits. Mathematically, someone who uses a PPP will end up having more money in retirement than any other type of account. It's because we're allowed to put more money every year. And so there's no magic to it. But um, if you can use the tax deferred nature of these plans over long periods of time, it really, really adds up in terms of how much wealth you can accumulate. So that's that's why Integris could, we, we could sell IPPs if we wanted to. Uh, you know, they've been around since 1991 and a lot of people know what an IPP is and 
that we would have no no fights or no no uh, discussions with anyone. They would say, oh, it's okay, it's an IPV. But we've decided that clients, Canadians deserve better. And that's why we created the PPP. Next slide. Now for, again, for the any of uh, the accountants or financial planners in the room, uh, this webinar, a quick note about the treatment of PPPs from a corporate tax deduction point of view. Um, what's beautiful about the PPP is that when the corporation, whether it's a, an OPCO or a HOLDCO, makes a contribution to the PPP, um, it moves off the balance sheet. So it's no, lo no longer caught by the Morneau tax measures, uh, the tax on passive investments, or even the tax on split income that the federal government introduced back in 2018. So all of the accountants who are worried, or financial planners who are worried that their corporate clients have stashed a lot of um, assets that are passive, that are growing, that are being invested in a passive manner and spitting out passive income by contributing those assets to the BBP, they're fixing that problem uh, at the same time. Uh, next slide. All right, so I promised you a case study, so here we are. Um, we have a, I think we need to click one more time. We have a 45 year old, uh, there we go, 45 year old uh, doctor who's happy with a 5% rate of return on assets. So I've just done this because I know that typically, you know, McNichol Associates generates a lot more than 5%, but this is to be ultra conservative and to say, Okay, what happens if we have a relatively modest risk profile and the client is happy with a 5% rate of return? What happens to the pension plan? Now, the professional corporation is paying a salary to this doctor of $150,000. I could have picked a higher uh, level, but there's no tax uh, advantage to, to uh, paying uh, a lot more. I mean, the, the true ceiling this year is $162,000 and change, but I picked 150 just for round numbers. And uh, this professional corporation has been around since 2010 and paying that kind of salary throughout. Now this doctor on his own has been able to accumulate about a $450,000 in an RRSP because they didn't know about pensions. They only, they only knew about RRSP, like 98% of Canadians. So, you know, RSP season rolls around. They make their contribution every year. And they've been doing that for a number of years. So now they have about $450,000 sitting in the RSP. Now they're 45, but they'd like to retire 20 years from now at 65. So we're giving ourselves a 20 year ramp or runway uh, to accumulate monies in the pension plan. And the pressure corporation is taxed at the lowest possible rate of 12.2% right now in Ontario. So let's move on to the next slide. Those are the assumptions. Now, right away, most people say, okay, I know I could put a lot of money in an RRSP. I could max out my RRSP every year. What can you do with the PPP? How much more money can I contribute and therefore claim tax deductions for above and beyond what I'm already allowed to do? Tell me what's, what's special about this. Well, in this particular case, over the 20 year period, this doctor's company, the, the pressure corporation, can put $405,000 in, in change, more than what he would be able to contribute to an RRSP. Okay. So that's the first um, conclusion. Next slide. Now, I've told you that this money is growing at 5%, and remember, this is extra money that we're allowed to contribute. So let's click a couple of times. And then, so if that money is growing at 5%, it's going to generate extra capital. So if you look at the next slide, we'll see how much more. So this doctor ends up with a PPP advantage, meaning additional registered assets at retirement of $684,000. So that's almost $700,000 more money to retire on than had he maxed out his RSP and grown it at 5%. Now you're going to tell me, well, obviously, if you put an extra four and five thousand dollars, it's going to grow. Well, yeah, but 
remember that four and five thousand dollars is tax deductible to the business okay next slide so the next question we get is well this seems unfair why is it that your ppp client is able to claim four and five thousand dollars more in terms of tax deductions than me and my rsp uh, one more click and it really builds it really um it, it really breaks down into four different categories remember that pension legislation is more generous than rsp rules if this wasn't the case integris would not exist we would not be selling ppps um, so how do we utilize this difference in the legislation? Well, remember that I told you you could do buyback of past service? So this doctor is able, the corporation is able to claim a $66,000 and change a corporate tax deduction for buying back those 10 years of past service. Now, on an annual basis from now until he turns 65, we're able to put more money than the RSP maximum every year. And that gap gets bigger with age. So when we tally up all the additional amounts that can be put in the PPP beyond what an RSP allows, we have this $315,000 um, extra contribution. Now, if you remember that little pie chart with the yellow AVC component, the account, we're allowed to do some personal tax deductible contributions as well over the 20 year period. So that's almost $19,000 of personal tax deductions and finally you'll recall that i've used a five percent rate of return assumption on how the money is growing inside the ppp or the rsp well that's less than the seven and a half percent that is prescribed by the cra when you have one of these plans so that gives the company the ability to do additional tax deductible special payments and in this case we have another close to forty five hundred dollars of additional tax deductions. So that's how we end up with $405,000 of extra tax assistance that didn't exist with the RSP system. Next slide. So I think now we're going to, we, we've looked at this particular case study, uh, but we should try to see, well, what happens if the facts are different? If it's not a 45 year old, but a, I don't know, a 55 year old, what would happen if the age instead of being 45 was 55? So let's, um, I don't know if it's David or Ken, if you can yeah. just click on where it says, yeah, let's make that 55. Okay. And let's say that uh, they had the business for, because they're a little bit older, they've had the business for 10 years instead of five years. And the salary, let's make it 120, not 150. Let's be a little more conservative. And let's keep the past salary at 80. So maybe the accountant used to tell them, don't take too much by with salary, do more dividends, just try to max out your, your CPP. So this is so if you hover the mouse, you see the two graphs, an RSP and a, um, a PPP growth curve. So at different ages, you can see how much money would be accumulated and the difference between the two strategies, right? So that's, in this case, it's over $800,000 that this client is leaving on the table because they insist on being in an RSP when the law allows them to put more money in a tax sheltered environment through the PPP. So let's hover the mouse and put it at age 64 instead of 70. Let's see by that point in time, Okay, so it's un under half a million dollar that they're leaving on the table at, at that point in time. So, David, did you have any other age configurations that you wanted to look at before well, we move on to the next one slide? Question, one question that we'll get to at the end was, what about if someone's uh, older? And actually, there's one uh, uh, person, one gentleman, I'll leave his name uh, anonymous, asking uh, in your first... Uh, calculation there before we put this uh, calculator on the screen he asked is your assumption that the t4 income stays at 150,000 for 20 years so i guess in that first example the answer would be yes but it doesn't have to stay at that so maybe try to answer that and, and yeah. we'll look at the different age group so when we do a projection we take the current year t4 
and we assume that it's not going to go down, that it's going to be indexed by some factor, typically um, 3%. So we assume the salary is going to increase at 3%. Now on this table here, we, we say that the salary increase assumption is 5.5% because we're using, on this illustration, we're using um, the CRA prescribed assumptions. But when we run an illustration like the one that was shown for the doctor, we use much more realistic and much more conservative assumptions. So we assume that the salary is growing at 3.5% instead of 5.5%. So when we do the calculations, it's a percentage of the revised, updated, indexed salary. Okay, okay, that's great. That, that answered that uh, person's question. So why don't we look at another example? Maybe someone who says, oh, I've missed this. Uh, this is not going to be an advantage. So let's say a 65-year-old uh, JP and help me fill out the rest of the, uh, the well, box. Well, presumably they've, he or she has had their business for a while, so you may want to put more years of service. So maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20. And usually if they're at their tail end, they, they're doing well and their salary might be a little bit higher. Past service could be a little bit higher than 80. Let's make it 100 maybe. So now you can see what this 65-year-old who finally gets around to setting up a PPP is able to generate in terms of additional registered assets by the time they have to start taking money out of the plan by age 71. So here in this case, it's a little bit shy of a half a million dollar of extra value that we just added. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay, well, we can do some more scenarios at the end as maybe part of the Q&A. So maybe we'll go back to your uh, slide deck. Sure. Okay, thank you. So now we've, we've demonstrated mathematically that um, this client will be able to claim a lot more tax deductions than had they uh, done an RSP. And we've shown that that's going to balloon into more wealth in retirement. That's good. But then people ask me, okay, well, that's that's cool. Thank you. But are there any other tax advantages that are unique to pensions, which can might help me tip the balance and make it easier to sell this to a business owner? And there are, there are three. So let's, let's keep going. Next slide. The first one that I wanted to cover, you may want to click again, is that the investment management fees under any pension plan, whether it's a regular pension plan, an IPP or a PPP, are tax deductible under the Income Tax Act whereas they are not in an RSP because it's prohibited. So here we took the assets of this doctor. Uh, remember, he started with $450,000 in RSPs, and then we made annual contributions, and we grew this money at 5%. So you can see the assets in the left column balloon, ballooning over time. And then we've applied here, and you know this is not uh, set in stone, but... I've used a man, an arbitrary 1% of assets fee. So, you know, depending on many different circumstances, the, uh, the McNichol team might charge more or less. It depends on many factors. But so just for ease of calculation, we've assessed a 1% investment management fee. And because it's tax deductible and because the corporation normally would be paying tax at 12.2%, we can see each year what kind of corporate taxes have been saved thanks to the PPP? So when we tally it all up, it's as if we had created a credit of 38,511, right? Which you didn't have with the RSP because it's not tax deductible. So let's, let's go to the next slide. And I say, why is this important? If we click again, the you know, when you have a pension plan, obviously you have to pay for its maintenance, maintenance and upkeep, and you need you need actuaries and you need a whole team to make sure the plan is um, following all applicable laws. So, in the worst case scenario, um, the fees over that 20-year period would be 74,580. But now I've just told you in the previous slide that we have a credit because the company is saving all of these taxes by claiming the investment management fees as tax deductions. So really, in true economic terms, 
the true cost of the PPP now shrinks to 36,069, which over 20 year works out to about 1,800 a year. So that's, that's, um, that's the first part. But remember this 36,069 because it's going to come up on the next slide when we flip to it right now. So I told you this, there's a true cost of 36,069. But remember, we're able to claim $405,000 of additional tax deductions at the corporate level. And if the corporation is paying tax at 12.2%, that's as if the company had saved 49,511 extra in terms of corporate taxes. So now we're looking at a true cost of 36,000, but a credit, a further credit of 49,511. So now it turns out that not only does the PPP cost nothing, it actually produces a refund of 13,446. So it auto finances itself because it unlocks tax deductions and tax credits or tax refunds that were not eligible or were not accessible when the business owner was using the RSP to save for retirement. So this is, this is an odd feature of the PPP is that it actually costs you nothing. It makes money, guaranteed. So that's point number one. And if we go to the next slide, so point number one is not only does the PPP auto finances itself in terms of fees, it actually generates extra cash, about 13 grand, after paying the integrous fee, but that's looking at the tree. If you look at the forest, it also, that's the second bullet, it also generates more retirement capital, $684,000 at the end of the 20 year period. So not only does it cost nothing, it also puts $684,000 in your bank account in registered assets available for retirement. So when I hear people say, oh, I'm not sure about doing a PPP, there are fees that I don't have to, cover when I have an RRSP. I'm like, I think you may need to go back to school and learn some basic math because this costs you nothing and it puts a lot more money in your pocket for retirement. And that's why we're so happy with this product because it's rare that you have products that can do this for you, guaranteed. This is not based on picking the right stock. This is purely a tax play. Next slide. Okay, let's look at another tax deduction, um, which if you click, we have to click a few times. So now we're gonna talk about thermal funding. So thermal funding is what happens if the business owner um, decides to turn on the pension sooner than the expected retirement age of, let's say 65. So if we look at this table, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, the basic pension that's promised by the pension plan at different retirement ages. So if you look at age 65 in the year 2041, our doctor would be entitled to $166,000 and change of annual pension. But if the doctor came to you and said, no, 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 I wanna retire at 62. Well, we have to reduce the size of the pension. We cannot afford to pay $166,000 a year. So the actuaries will do a correction and will say, okay, sure, you can start at 62 in the year 2038, but we're only gonna pay you 122,923, which is fair. But if we click again, we're able to do, uh, click again, please. We're able to do a $530,000 terminal funding contribution from the company to the pension plan. Uh, click again, there we go. $530,000, that's a corporate tax deduction from pre-tax dollars. So you know what that would give you in terms of tax savings, but let's ignore that for the moment. Now, because we've injected this money into the pension plan, if we click again, the pension plan has more cash. So it can now offer an initial pension starting at age 62 of 163,909, which is almost what was promised at age 65, which was 166,000. So we haven't really suffered that much by way of standard of living, but we've given our own company over half a million dollar write-off. 
So for again, for the accountants in the room that are looking for tax write-offs for their corporate clients, let's talk about terminal funding. Now, remember this 163909 initial pension that's starting to be paid at age 62, because it's gonna come up on the next slide. Now we're gonna talk about another tax advantage, which is um, pension income splitting. So unlike an RRSP or a RIF, where you have to be 65 in Canada in order to benefit from income splitting with a spouse, because a PPP is a registered pension plan, we can start at any age. So you could be 50, you could be 45, and you could be income splitting your pension with your spouse. So let's use this doctor. His age 62 pension is 163,909. Now, I've used the Ernst & Young uh, online tax calculator, and it tells me that if he were to take all of that income on his tax return, he'd have to pay 52,100 in combined federal, provincial, personal tax. But like I said, because this is a true pension plan and we don't have to wait till we're 65 to income split, we can allocate half of that onto the tax return of our spouse. Let's say it's a stay at home dad or mom that doesn't have any income. So now that spouse will be paying tax on their half and we pay tax on the other half. So as a couple, we're paying combined federal Ontario taxes for the couple of 34,648. So if we click one last time, what is it that we've achieved? Well, we've saved $17,000 in change every year in personal taxes, just with this paper exercise of transferring half of the pension income to the tax return of the spouse who has a, a lower or no income. And I got a little banner at the bottom saying this is not bad given that the most expensive version of the PPP has an annual cost of 3,300. Well, remember, with all the other tax deductions that we've been talking about, there is no cost. We've eliminated that cost. But let's assume that for whatever reason, we ignore all the other stuff we've been talking about and we're just looking at it from this point in time onwards. We are, we are uh, generating so much by way of taxes that it covers our costs a number of times over. So next slide, just to frame it in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, so the PPP's income splitting rules generate 17 grand per year in taxes saved, but you gotta pay for Integris. So it's as if Integris was cutting you a check every year of 14 grand saying, thank you for being a client. Why don't you take that to take a Caribbean holiday every year? Right? Or maybe buy some other financial product with this money. Once you buy a universal life policy or whole life policy or split dollar critical illness policy, whatever, it's your money. Next slide. So to wrap up sort of, because we wanted to leave time for questions, um, to wrap up what we've been discussing, what has happened? Well, the client is substantially wealthier in retirement than had he relied on the RSP. We know that because he's got almost $700,000 more in registered assets, and this ignores the terminal funding. We could have put another $200,000 had we decided to do terminal funding at age um, 65. The company, which is a big asset of this client, has also saved substantially more tax than had he stayed in the RSP. We know that because he was able to claim four and five thousand dollars in well the company was able to claim four and five thousand dollars of extra deductions and that again ignores any terminal funding and the couple because after all we're doing this for human beings the couple is saving over 14 grand a year thanks to the income splitting on top of everything else and we already know that the cost of the program is taken care of by the tax refunds and the savings it's not something that the client has to dig in their pockets for it auto finances itself. So to me, those are good results, but that's not the end of the story because on top of that, we offer the highest level of creditor protection in Canada because this is a registered pension plan. And this is critical because it's a pension plan, we can go into non RSP eligible asset classes. So McNichol and Associates has the ability to build portfolios that are not even RSP eligible, but they would be PPP eligible to push 
through alternatives, the efficient frontier that Joe was talking about. And, and this is something that IPPs don't offer, because we're dealing with Integris, we provide fiduciary oversight through our team of pension lawyers to provide an extra layer of protection and optimization uh, to the structure. So this is unique in Canada. Next slide. So going back to our fundamental questions that clients ask themselves, do I want to pay less tax than 98% of Canadians are using the RSP? Most people would say yes. Do I want to maximize my retirement income without taking any extra market risk? Do I want the extra $700,000 in retirement or no? Yes. And do I want the tax refunds to pay for the cost of program instead of me having to pay it out of my own pocket? Most people like a freebie. So the answer would be yes. So if you also think that these are all yeses, then we really need to start a conversation. Next slide. But if you thought this was great, we haven't even scratched the surface in terms of the other tax advantages and legal advantages that the PPP has over the RRSP. Uh, we're not going to go into it now. We'll reserve some of these for questions. But there's there are 20 factors or uh, advantages that the PPP has over an RSP that 98% of Canadians don't even know about, let alone understand. And that's why it's really important to have a dialogue and to learn more about this pension legislation and therefore become equipped with tools that can push the envelope and produce even more net new value for clients. Uh, next slide. So I'll turn it back to, to David and, and Joseph, uh, but um, thank you for your, for your attention. Um, I there are probably lots of questions, so let's let's get to it. That was excellent, and uh, I should have put this on at the beginning, but that that's a nice image of you, JP. Thank you for the presentation and uh, the calculator, and um, yeah. So there's some questions that are just coming in now, and I think I'll start with some uh, more basic ones here, JP. And uh, here's one: Can you provide a detailed target market for the PPP income level? years in business, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the ultimate client for us is a family business that's been around for a while, where there's successive generations of uh, family members on the payroll. That's, to us, it, it's you can't beat it, because you see what happens is this. Let's say, and I'll give you an example, David. Um, I had a, um, a client come to us with an IPP, and he had over $8 million in his IPP, and he was 73. And the first thing I asked him is, says, well, do you have any kids in your family business on the payroll? And his answer was, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have three. I said, well, why are they not part of your IPP? He goes, well, I don't know. So I said, well, the first thing we'll do is we'll put them as members of the plan with you. So it's going to turn into a family PPP. And the reason why we're doing that is because, you see, if you die, there's a deemed disposition, unless you can do a spousal rollover, but let's say you die with your spouse in the same car accident, or you don't have a spouse. Um, if you die, there's a deemed disposition under the Income Tax Act, and that $8 million will be subjected to tax usually at the highest bracket. So that means at least 50% of that money will go to the government. So the children will get the other 4 million. But because, this, because of what we told them to do, now if he were to pass away, instead of giving $4 million to CRA, all of the money in the plan, the full 8 million becomes pension surplus. And because his children are part of the plan, they can now utilize that surplus to fund their own pension. So, you know, with a stroke of a pen, Integris just saved this family $4 million. That's a good rate of return, right? With no risk. So that's an example of where uh, knowledge of the law, understanding how pensions work, and being able to 
do a critical analysis uh, can really generate extra value for, for, for Canadians. So to answer the question, family business with multiple generations on the payroll, the ultimate. This is unbeatable. Now, if you don't meet that criteria uh, or criterion, um, then incorporate professionals that have limited ways of claiming tax deductions otherwise. We're thinking here your doctors, your dentists, your pharmacists, your lawyers, uh, your engineers, your architects, those who may have limited abilities to claim deductions, they and they don't have family members on the payroll, they are also very good. And finally, the other category of perfect client are C-suite executives of very large companies. So we're talking CEOs, for example, or CFOs or whatever, of very, very large companies where the compensation envelope, what those companies are willing to pay is quite significant. And what I mean by that is usually above $300,000. So when you have an employer that's willing to pay at least that amount or more by way of salary and bonus every year, and you know that, that's going to be taxed at, in Ontario at 53.5%. Why, why flush that much cash down the drain when you could defer the tax and put it to work inside of a PPP and maybe even a retirement compensation arrangement? So those, to answer that first question, those are the three uh, key um, groups of people that we're looking at. Family businesses with multiple generations, highly paid professionals and non-shareholder, but C-suite executives of larger companies with large compensation. We've had someone sign up that had a $40,000 salary and it still made sense. So we, the income levels can go quite low and it will still make sense even after factoring the fees because as I showed you, the, uh, the tax refunds from everything that the PPP does covers the fees anyway. So it's a very, very flexible uh, model. And then in terms of age, unlike an IPP where normally you have to be at least 40 for this to make sense, we don't have that problem because of our triple account uh, structure. So our young people, especially in a family business, they can use the defined contribution limits, which are much higher than the IPP limits when they're young. So they'll end up with significantly more money in retirement. Okay, that's great, JP. Uh, that answers uh, another question that the earlier that someone asked about the differences between I, an IPP and a PPP. Um, for those still questioning or wondering the differences, just uh, drop us a note and then we'll send you a fact sheet back uh, comparing the two. Uh, following up with your last question, question there, does this scenario make sense for a sole proprietor that is a professional? And I'll answer that initially, JP, and then hand it over to you. Uh, the answer would be yes. And uh, that I, I can, uh, it looks like me because uh, we started this a couple of years ago with Integris, uh, and my wife and myself uh, being uh, proprietors of uh, McNichol and Associates. And uh, yeah, so we're in our 50s and uh, we're well down the path. So we're eating what we what we cook here. Over to you, JP. Yeah, so I'll just put on my, my lawyer hat on and um, say that to me, sole proprietor uh, might be interpreted in a different way than the way you presented it, which is you have a business, you own a business, and therefore you were able to set up a PPP. Um, when I was back in, in law school, sole proprietor meant someone who's not incorporated that's just in business on their own, sort of like your, your plumber that just shows up and you're paying them directly and you're not paying a corporation. Uh, so if you are a sole proprietor, because there's no employment relationship, because you're just a business person on your own without the payment of T for income, then um, you yourself cannot have a PPP. But if you have an employee that's collecting a salary from you, then that person can have a PPP. So normally we need an employment relationship and the payment of T for income 
for the PPP to be um, put in place. Okay. Um, geez, they're just flooding in here. So I'm going to go to some questions that were uh, emailed in uh, before the presentation. Here's one that would have been a great opening question. This seems too good to be true. How come no one told me about this before? Uh, over to you, JP. Well, those that know about it do PPPs, and they really have no incentive to let others know about it. Right? People that are in the know are signing up for PPPs. Um, now, why is it that it's not being broadcast on the television and at the Super Bowl? Why is there no PPP ads at the Super Bowl? Um, well, we're not the Royal Bank. We're not Manulife. We're not, you know, we are a smaller cane company. And um, what we do is we work through centers of influence. So financial planners, accountants, portfolio managers like McNichol and Associates, that's how we, we've, attacked, we've attacked the market to educate people about it. Um, it's a slow process. It's very technical. There's a lot of rules to, to, to know about. And therefore, a lot of people um, take the easy way out and say, oh, I can't be bothered learning about this. I'm just going to do RSPs. That's simple. That's been around since 1957. Everybody talks about RSP. We even have RSP season. There's no such thing as PPP season. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that's what happens in Canada. A lot of people don't bother making the investment in time to learn about pension law. And therefore, they don't have anything to offer their clients. They're like everyone else. So it's a slow process. And that explains usually why people haven't heard about it. But we're changing that. Uh, we're having more and more of these webinars. And um, as people sort of digest the information and make it theirs, now they can use those tools to save a lot of money for their clients, or sometimes for themselves, like you're doing, David. Right. Uh, this one uh, we answered a moment ago, but just uh, to point out, it's come from, a, from an accounting firm, a major accounting firm, and it says, I have several clients contemplating IPPs, so I'd like to know some of the similarities and differences to PPPs. Uh, I think you've answered a, a, a number of the, uh, the large ones, and we'll make sure that that uh, person gets a, a copy of uh, the lists of A, a to B. Uh, comparing them. Um, here's one that just came in on the chat. Uh, can we sell it on our own or use your service? Uh, sorry, does that mean McNichol services or Integris? I think they mean the PPP. So this person says, can we sell it on our own or use your service? Maybe they well, do mean, mean, yeah, maybe they mean uh, the investment side. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be just McNichol. It could be any investment team that can do it. Uh, right. But on the P side, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, so um, we're, uh, to use a, an adage, we're kind of like the Hard Rock Cafe. You know, we love all, serve all. So there, we, we're not uh, embedded with any one portfolio management firm. Of course, we love McNichol Associates because of, your pension style investing and access to alternatives which a lot of pms don't do but uh, if someone wanted to use another uh, that is open to them and yeah. uh, we will accommodate that yeah that's right so the, the person clarified later on so yeah you don't have to use us um here's another one i think we've already answered this one jp do you do consultations to illustrate this to a family I would answer that. The calculator can do that, but yeah, JP, or or we can help. Uh, is there a fee that is associated with this consultation? No, there are no fees. We don't charge for for um, explaining what a PPP is and producing an illustration like we did for this doctor. Um, it's a 17-page report. 
we um, we don't, there are no fees, and I'm not the only one at Integris that does this. We have our uh, manager of sales and business development, uh, Miranda McLean, who does this day in and day out. She's constantly um, speaking with advisors and business owners, explaining what a PPP is and walking through all the numbers. So so we have, um, and we just hired a new person who's going to be uh, helping her as well. So. And of course, the McNichol folks can always uh, do that as well, but we um, we do that service all the time and there's no fee. Okay, here's another one. How does the PA factor into the amount of contributions allowed? So the PA or pension adjustment is what happens when you're accruing um, pension benefits under a registered pension plan, whether you're using a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan. So when the PPP is put in place, it's going to start spitting out pension adjustments, which are reported in box 52 of your T4 slip. And what the pension adjustment does is that it eats away at your otherwise accruing or uh, available RSP room. And the idea is that the tax authorities don't want people to be able to double dip too, too much and have lots of tax deductions to the PPP and then a full allotment of RSP room to further claim more tax deductions. The exception to that rule is in the first year, we have a double dip. So not only can we put whatever the actuaries tell us we're allowed to put into the PPP and claim that as a deduction, we can also put money in an RSP. And the legal reason for that is that the RSP contribution this year in 2021 is based on your 2020 earned income. But the PPP contribution in 2021 this year is based on your 2021 uh, employment income. So in 2021, we have both systems sort of um, stacking on top of each other. And that's why we're able to do a, a big double dip. Then in 2021, that generates a pension adjustment. So when you're looking at your RSP room in 2022, it gets eaten away by the pension adjustment that was created in 2021. So we're now stuck with a small $600 uh, RSP contribution that's still uh, eligible for uh, future years. Okay, here's one that I can answer. Will you be sending the recording to participants? Yeah, ab absolutely. Everybody who signed up for this, whether you attended or not, will be getting a copy of uh, this presentation and uh, the slide deck we can uh, send out separately as well. Uh, another question here, JP, can a lira be pulled in from a government pension ex-employer? Well, um, it depends. So. On December the 8th, 2020, the Ontario government um, brought into effect Bill 213, and that was omnibus legislation, the Red Tape Reduction Act, but one of the chapters of that legislation uh, made it possible for PPPs and NIPPs to, when they're offered to what's called a connected person, so someone who owns 10% or more of the shares of their own company, or family members through marriage or blood that are related to that shareholder. So if you're offering a PPP to a connected person, the plan is no longer registered with the Ontario Pension Authorities. And people who had a PPPs before could, through a, a, an exemption process, get to the same result. What does that mean? Well, it means that when you have a PPP now, the locking in rules that um, used to apply before December the 8th uh, are no longer in place. Therefore, um, this, the, the better view is that Lira money, because Lira money is locked in, can no longer flow into a PPP. Um, we're still verifying that with the, um, the CEO of the Financial Services Regulatory Authority, 
Uh, but that is our reading of the impact of this locking in. So my preliminary answer would be no. Okay, a couple more here. Um, if the owner is 70 years of age, can he, she still do it? And will it carry on as long as he, she is working? So, okay, great question. So being 70 or 71 is not an issue to join a pension plan. Now, at 71, you must start the decumulation. So you must begin to start drawing a pension from the pension plan. Um, but does that mean that you must cease to be employed? No, this is an exception to the rule. The general rule is that you cannot receive a salary and being employed and being retired and collecting a pension from the same employer at the same time. It's seen as a contradiction in terms. But that rule doesn't apply if you're collecting a pension because of your age and you're still employed. So you could both get a pension and a salary if you decide to work past age 71. Now, one last detail about this kind of weird situation of having a 70 year old finally waking up saying, oh, I should do a PPP. It makes a lot of sense in a family context because we had a case of a 71 year old gentleman who decided to set up a PPP. And the reason why he did it is because his two daughters were on the payroll of his company. So this allows him to do the intergenerational wealth transfer that I talked about when we were talking about the, the gentleman that had $8 million in his IPP. The 71 gentleman will be able to do the same thing when he passes away. Instead of taxing half of his money, he'll be giving it to his daughters instead. So he's not really doing it for himself because he's independently wealthy. He's got other sources of income. He doesn't really need the pension to live. But by having had the foresight of adding the two daughters to the plan, the financial advisor uh, was able to save the family hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. Excellent. Um, how are the funds treated if someone were to become a non-resident? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the great things about PPPs is that if a client decide to become a non-resident of Canada. Well, what happens under the Income Tax Act is you have what's called a departure tax or a deemed disposition on becoming a non-resident. So all of your assets are taxed. Uh, I think it's as of the day you became a non-resident or the day before, or I can't remember exactly the, the exact date, but you, you, you end up with a massive tax bill. It's the last kick of the can that the CRA has a against you but <clears throat> there's an exception to that rule and excluded from that tax calculation are what are called exempt assets and lo and behold the millions of dollars you've got sitting in your ppp are considered exempt assets so again you might save yourself quite a bit of taxes because you were the, the foresight to put a ppp in place but that's part one Part two is that when you do become a non-resident of Canada and the PPP is paying you your annual pension, under part 13 of the Income Tax Act, there's a flat 25% withholding tax that's applied by the financial institution that's paying out the pension. That flat 25% gets reduced thanks to the various tax conventions or tax treaties that Canada has with a number of countries around the world. And it gets reduced often to 15%. So if you move to a jurisdiction that has very light local taxation, you may end up only having to pay 15% tax on your, let's say $100,000 a year pension that's coming out of the PPP. So that to me is, is a non-negligible uh, advantage that most people aren't usually familiar with. 
That's major. Final question, and this could have been the first question. What is the best way to bring this up, this subject up with a small business owner? David, why don't you take a stab at that one? Yeah, yeah. It's um, as I said at the very outset of the presentation, I, I find this to be an excellent door opener. Uh, many people have not heard about PPPs. As JP said, uh, they might have heard about IPPs, but they might be caught up with information that's very outdated 20 years ago where IPPs were very expensive uh, to maintain and administer on an annual basis. So only a few people really chose them. And unfortunately, that mindset still exists today. So I think as a door opener, you just let let a small business owner know that number one they could have more money set aside for their retirement than just doing an rsp and uh, they don't always have to do it every year if the business has a, a, a bad run for a year or two that's fine uh, the ppp can be uh, uh, postponed and, the, and uh, it's it's just a it's a it's a great door opener and as i said at the very beginning even if the small business owner isn't interested in it at the end of the day, it might uh, offer other planning opportunities, uh, investment opportunities, and even looking at uh, alternative products uh, from, from the life side. Uh, that's, that's my answer to that. JP, anything you want to add before we uh, shut down here? That was great. It allowed me to get a, a bit of water, to drink a bit of water. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Thanks for everything, JP and Joe. Excellent presentation. And we'll get this out to everybody and just write in with any more questions you might have or if you'd like to us to run any scenarios for you. Okay, take care now. Bye-bye.